Hello and welcome to part two of this professional learning segment on co-teaching. This segment will now focus on co-instructing, whereas the prior learning segment, part one, focused on co-planning. My name is Dr. Derek Riddle. I'm an assistant professor here at CSU Stanislaus in the Department of Teacher Education. The threefold purpose of this training is similar to the training in part one. First, to provide you with an understanding of the components of co-instructing so that you may apply that framework to your own efforts at co-instructing and then to be able to also self-assess your efficacy towards effective co-instructing. I would also like to again thank our partners at Cal Poly. Their rubric tool allows us to have a clearer conception of co-instructing. Again, co-instructing is one of the three core components of the co-teaching model. Co-teaching is comprised of co-planning, which was discussed in part one, co-instructing, the focus of this segment, and co-assessing, which will be elaborated further in part three in another training video. Co-instructing is comprised of four unique models to be used in various teaching such situations and contexts. In each situation, you'll need to be mindful of A, what each co-teacher's role will be in that teaching situation in order to enhance student learning, B, how each co-teacher will be equally positioned in the teaching situation, and finally C, the level and type of communication that will occur between co-teachers during that teaching situation. We will spend the next few slides discussing each of these more in depth. Please feel free to refer to the rubric while we discuss these next few slides, as well as to stop the training when prompted or when needing to review the rubric. When co-instructing, you may choose between one or more of these four distinctive models to utilize in lesson delivery. They are team teaching, parallel teaching, station teaching, and alternative teaching. The next few slides will define and explain aspects of each model while also providing opportunities for you to generate application for their use. So first, team teaching allows both teachers to be in front of the class working together to provide instruction. As you can see in the picture, one teacher is teaching while the other is on standby, ready to either add to the instruction or provide the next portion of instruction. This may work well when one teacher is stronger at a certain aspect of the lesson than another. This also is a good model to use in teacher preparation if the cooperating teacher or the student teacher wants to model a teaching strategy for the other to learn. At the secondary level, this may work well if you teach the same lesson more than once as it allows for co-teachers to switch roles in subsequent lessons. Take a moment here to pause and discuss how you might apply this model to an upcoming lesson. The second model, parallel teaching, allows each teacher to take half of the class in order to reduce student-teacher ratio. Groups may be doing the same content in the same way, the same content in a different way, or different content altogether. As you can see in the picture, this model allows for teachers to focus on a smaller group in order to improve student achievement. This model may also allow for differentiated instruction, where one teacher may work to extend the learning for some learners, while the other works to remediate or reteach to students who are struggling. For teacher preparation, this also allows for a student teacher to have independent opportunities to practice their craft without the teacher leaving the room, but also not necessarily under their direct supervision. Take a moment here to pause and discuss how you might apply this model to an upcoming lesson. Station teaching allows for co-teachers to divide students into three or more small groups to go to stations or centers. Students rotate through these centers, and teachers can facilitate individual stations or circulate among all students. As you can see in the picture, this model is much like parallel teaching, but allows for smaller groups for co-teachers to focus on. This model may work better for chunking instructional segments rather than for remediation. For example, one teacher teaches a concept to a small group, while the other teacher teaches a different concept. This model is like team teaching, but in small groups rather than using a whole group. This model may also allow the cooperating teacher to observe the student teacher teach a small group while circulating to the other groups, or vice versa for the student teacher to observe the cooperating teacher while also circulating to the other stations and groups. Take a moment here to pause and discuss how you might apply this model to an upcoming lesson. Finally, the fourth model, alternative teaching, allows for one teacher to work with a larger group of students while the other works with a smaller group. Both teachers are providing reteaching, pre-teaching, or enrichment as needed. Depending on how you divide the class and the needs of the students, this is a good model for remediation or extension. 
As you can see in the picture, the teacher with the large group might be moving the class forward, reteaching or extending, while the teacher of the small group may be doing the exact same. For teacher preparation, this model again allows for an opportunity for a student teacher to learn to differentiate the content to specific learners and have some independent time to do so without the cooperating teacher leaving the room. Often cooperating teachers are worried that they're not providing their student teachers an authentic experience. In this model, student teachers get to have a moment of that authentic experience. So take a moment to pause here and discuss how you might apply this model to an upcoming lesson. Now, after you've selected a model, it needs to be clear what each co-teacher's role will be in providing instruction. For co-teaching to work well and to enhance the next aspect of positionality, there should be a smooth transition between co-teachers. This happens in two ways. When both co-teachers understand their role, which should have been delineated in co-planning, and or when both teachers have a strong relationship that allows them to teach together seamlessly. Usually though, this happens when effective co-planning has occurred and working with this model over time to enhance the whole class and in individual learning. It's important for classroom management and seamless instruction to communicate to students that both teachers are positioned equally in the class by authority and respect. We do not want students playing the mom and dad game, as I call it, and trying to go to one co-teacher over another to meet their needs. To foster this, make sure consistent language such as we or our is used and the interactions between co-teachers are visibly respectable or respectful, excuse me. This should ensure students view both co-teachers as equals. A final aspect of co-instructing is that there will be times needed to support each other and make modifications during the teaching situation. Co-instructing allows for co-teachers to take moments during the lesson to huddle, which is not a discussion for students to hear about the instruction. These conversations should be centered in student data being collected during the lesson and or about instructional moves. This is not a time where you want to gossip about students or have a conversation about something unrelated to the instruction. So to provide you an effective model of co-instruction, myself and a colleague, again, Dr. John McFarland, filmed a portion of our co-instruction session to highlight some of the criterion of co-instructing. To provide you some context for the video, Dr. McFarland and I were teaching a segment of our EDSS 3900 course, Foundations of Secondary Education, to a small group of willing students. Our hope is that you will analyze and evaluate our exemplar in supporting your own efforts to co-instruct effectively. Here's the video. Well, thank you guys uh, for coming. Dr. Riddle and I, we have put together this quadrant activity. So you have the readings in front of you. You also have your devices. You have paper, pens, pencils, everything you're gonna need for this particular activity. All we want from you also is to make sure that you are able to communicate with each other and share ideas. So let's start off with the first quadrant here on the picture. This kind of refers to our readings as well. So what we would like you to do is actually um, either draw a picture, find a picture on your phone that refers to the 16th, 17th century um, in relation to the readings and the educational philosophies that were going on in that time period. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna give you a few a minutes right now so that you can either search something, start creating a masterpiece, okay? And then we will um, come to you and check in and then we'll, we'll share out. And if, okay? Dr. McFarland, if I can add a piece, please. Just one, right? Don't feel like you have to find a picture that covers the expansiveness of those century, or, you know, two centuries. Just maybe one event that you thought was particularly interesting and something that's related to that. Yeah, so okay. definitely you wanna look for that significance. Okay, cool, all right. Artistic okay. I think that we give me okay. a few minutes to do this one. Okay. And then you're gonna do this one. Perfect. Okay. And then see where they are. And then wrong. we can even skip the dance. Yeah. Go straight into kind of spell yeah. tank. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So kind of what the course is about, right? We we're doing this activity but talking a little bit out of the side of our mouth why, right? You want to do this with your students too, right? So it's one thing to just lecture at them and say, here are the facts, but mm -hmm. another thing for them to make sure they process and internalize what they've got out of the reading, what you hopefully want them to get out of the reading. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a great activity to be a little bit more student-centered so we're not just lecturing to you about the history. And so you're doing a great job. So we wanna jump now to the next section. Thinking now about the 1800s, same process. What was significant, what stood out, what do you think was interesting in terms of education? Um, but this time, think about a song. Or as you talked about, I'll let you share that. Well, um, we, you could also, um, if you're familiar with different composers, right? you can also think about that as well. So the idea is, it doesn't always have, I mean, composer could work, and that could be something that helps you remember, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of the purpose of this activity, getting you to just internalize some of those ideas. The other piece, it could just be a song maybe from now, right? Something you heard the other day that goes, oh, this reminds me of what I read in the reading, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always have to be some Beethoven piece from the 1800. But if Beethoven, like mm -hmm. Dr. McFarland says, help you remember that, that's fine. So well, that's making more relevancy for you, you know? So you're able to make those connections to what you already have now, and then you're able to make those connections to the past. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead, give me a couple minutes to do that one. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Like, oh, isn't that when, like, the whole...